welcome, welcome again to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, I'm Matt Barnes, morning co-anchor at NBC4 today. I'm also a member of the CMC Board of Trustees. So pleased to have you with us here today. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank today's partner, the Columbus Council of On World Affairs, and today's sponsor as well, the United Way of Central Ohio and Bell Harbor Management of Ohio. <laughs> Sorry, give yourself a little love. We'd like to thank the Great Insurance Audubon Center and their amazing staff for their ongoing support and for hosting us here, so I want to thank them. Thank you as well to the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for presenting today's live stream, which is carried on CMC's social media platforms, which again, you can find in your forum flyer. So I want to thank all those for supporting today's forum. And now for while you're really here, let's get to our topic, right? Ohio's Latino community is comprised of more than a half million people, accounting for 4.2% of our state's total population. That according to a 2021 report released by the Ohio Department of Development. Ohio's Latino population more than doubled just since 2000 and has more than tripled since 1980. The community is younger than the state average and faces higher unemployment, but it's growing rapidly and now owns more than 2,000 businesses in the state. So today we're going to explore the state of Ohio's Latino community, a half million strong and growing. To introduce today's speakers, we're gonna welcome Patrick Terrian from today's partner, the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Patrick. Thanks. All right, all right, all right. The, the Council on World Affairs is uh, pleased to be a partner with the Metropolitan Club. Our whole mission is to educate our community about the world and why it matters. And part of why it matters is right here in this room. I mean, the world's here. Um, there's probably, you know, a half dozen to languages and two dozen countries represented right here in this, in this room. And that's one of the things we try to emphasize when we're working with our 1,200 high school students. Yeah, 1,200, that's a lot of, that's a lot of hormones and a lot of sounds. <laughs> Um, 1,200 high school students and thousands of professionals through our, through our training. Besides Latin America and Hispanic diversity, there is always one thing I notice in the room when there are Hispanics and Latinos. There is so much energy and, and laughing and joy. I mean, what the heck, right? I mean, I've been to a lot of forums, but these are always the most fun. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the distinguished speakers for today. Um, and I'll start, I'll start in the middle with Lourdes Barroso de Padilla, who is a city council person for uh, the city of Columbus. Thank you. Yes. And to her, to her left is Roland Medrano. He's CEO at La Mega Media. He's also board chair of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Let's give a round of applause for Roland. And to today's host and moderator for the discussion, Jackie Orozco, who is co-anchor of Good Day Columbus, ABC6 News, Fox 28. Take it away. All right, thank you so much. All right, ¿cómo están todos? ¿Bien? Nada más la faltaba la música, right? We, then we could all party. All right, this is when the fun begins. So, like you mentioned, I'm Jackie Orozco, ABC6 the number one station, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> again, we're here to talk about half a million Latinos here in Ohio. I wanna quickly uh, just talk about a little bit my story, how I came to Columbus, Ohio, because I've never been to Ohio. Uh, actually, work brought me here. I'm from Chicago, born and raised there. Uh, my parents are from Guadalajara, Mexico. And, oh, Mexicanos? All right, all right, love it. Um, but my husband, Rodney Dunnigan, is sitting over here, very supportive. Uh, we both, he's also in media, he's an assistant news director at the station as well, but I'm still the boss. Um, <laughs> we came from Florida, and it was just a job opportunity here. It was kind of like a duo package, and it's something we couldn't turn down. And at first, when I came to Columbus, I'm like, there's, there's Latinos here? And I was blown away. I was just like, wow, there was Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, like you name it, you know. And then I just meet, when you meet one Latino here, you're like connected to everybody. So I'm just very uh, happy and, and proud to be here. And that's why I wanted to talk a little bit with, um, you know, Ludus and, and Roland. How did you guys come to Columbus? Ludus? Uh, 
So, well, first and foremost, I want to thank CMC and say, um, in the words of Lizzo, it's about damn time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> not for nothing, me yes. handle, not for nothing. I also want to say I kind of feel like it's my quinceanera yeah. today <laughs> with all the friends who came. I appreciate your support. It's really our quinceanera, me It is, it is. Um, uh, I came because uh, I was born here. Mm -hmm. So my parents, I like to say they were early settlers here in the Great Plains <laughs> of Ohio. Then my parents actually came from Cuba in 1970. And uh, no, there is not a direct pipeline from Havana, Cuba to uh, Columbus, Ohio. They came because like most immigrants, migrants, and refugees, they knew someone. Um, it was my, in the most Latino of stories, it was my aunt's hairdresser who became a very good friend of the family's, mm -hmm. who was married to an American, and my parents came to Miami, um, like most, like, like every good Cuban should. And um, <laughs> then they, my, my aunt said, listen, uh, this is a good place to raise a family. Mm -hmm. They had no idea where oil was, all the Latinos will get that joke. <laughs> um, they had no idea where oil was, they had no idea what winter was, and mm -hmm. so they came, and um, right before winter actually my dad's first job was a busboy at the Kikiki restaurant interesting fun fact about the Kikiki at the time is uh, all the busboys were Latino and everyone who worked mm. in the kitchen was Asian I'm not sure how they communicated but that my friends is the power <laughs> of friendship and love um, and my mother worked at my aunt's hair salon and she swept up hair clippings and washed heads for a quarter a head and learned English by watching All My Children in One Life to Live, which is everything you need to know about my very um, dramatic <laughs> Latina mother. And um, I grew up a very Columbus kid, right? Going to Spanish speaking church on the weekends and big dances. My dad had the first Latino food store in Columbus, which was much more than a supermarket. It was really, this was in the 80s when there was no community center. I mean, everybody was like, you met people at church where you went to my dad's store. Mm -hmm. And um, he built in a back room so that my family could eat dinner there and they could have like dominoes tournaments in the back um, with his friends, right? Because that's how they built community together. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up, I mean, like many, as a first generation kid, uh, growing up very much in two different cultures mm -hmm. that were, you know, often at odds with each other. My sisters, who are um, much older than me, those are just facts, um, <laughs> were, I mean, there was no ESL. Like they sat in classes where they spoke English literally the entire time. Mm. I mean, and, and I'll turn it over because there's many more stories to tell, but this is a, just a fun, quick funny story about my sisters. Um, literally, when I say they didn't understand English, one day my parents lived in what was Beverly Manor or Greenbrier, it became, um, and they had a, uh, a, a fire escape, and my sisters were out on the fire escape, and they were talking to each other, and they were like, blah, 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 blah. my mom was like, girls, what are you doing? And they were like, speaking English. <laughs> Because that's what it sounded like to them, yeah, right? Yeah. And so these poor babies, like, they, that, when you talk about total immersion, mm -hmm. I mean, then you think about where we are now, where we are sitting in a room actually talking about Latinos within my lifetime. I mean, that's how fast this population is growing and the population of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in Columbus and throughout the state, so. Thank you, Lourdes. Well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, top, gotta top that. <laughs> All right, so I said, let Lourdes go first. That was a mistake. <laughs> How do you follow that now? Um, so um, I guess what brought me to Columbus was Lane Bryant as a retail executive, and that's what got me here. But um, my story is I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's the Gilligan Island story. Those are old enough to remember that, uh, which is in a two-year tour. My dad was with the Organization of American States. And uh, in 68, we came here. And uh, military coup, late 68, and the two-year tour ended up being a lifetime. And uh, so from D.C., went to New York, got into the retail business, and, uh, and that's what I've been doing until 2012. Uh, and uh, in 2012, I decided, well, actually, my kids decided that they did not want to move anymore. They loved Columbus, they had their friends, and uh, made the decision to stay here in Columbus and uh, invest in, and started business. Uh, I have, uh, I own three locations, Office Evolution, shared workspaces here in Columbus. And, uh, and then, uh, the story about once you meet one Latino. Yep. Well, I didn't know any, right? I came from the corporate world, and, um, you know, I, 
only lived here three years. Um, in 2009, it was 2012 when I was making these decisions, and I meet Lily Cavanaugh of Oslac, you know, Googling Hispanic, you know, because I wanted to do something for the community. And sure enough, they said, I don't know anybody, you know, but don't worry about it, you know, we'll get you connected. Well, years later, <laughs> uh, got me into uh, the Hispanic Chamber. I met Claudia de Leon, who's the president uh, of the chamber. Uh, and, um, and that's how I begin to get involved with the Latino community. Um, I said, I don't want to be involved in politics. I'm about business. I do strategy. Well, once you're in the Latino community, politics, social aspects, and business, they're all intertwined. You can't, even if you try, and I have, can't get away from it. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so uh, the, uh, in 2018, we had the opportunity, Claudia came to me, she was working with La Mega and said, you know, there is this business opportunity and I would love to see if, you know, you're interested in, in, in joining me and, uh, and see if we can take this business forward. And, uh, and it was exciting uh, because I feel that um, uh, our uh, mission is very different than most media companies. Ours is rooted really in the community. It's really about helping, supporting, and inspiring the community. That's what we do. We also make sure that we're a reliable source of information for the community. And finally, you know, we look at ourselves as the bridge the bridge to connect the community at large to the Hispanic community. You can't have a successful community if it doesn't integrate itself to the community at large. So that's kind of, a, of our task. So uh, long story short, um, I'm happy to be here and, uh, and I hope that uh, we can have a, uh, I guess, a enlightening conversation. Yeah, all right. Now, one thing we heard them both talk is just how they're connected. Once you know one Latino, then you know everybody. And I love the fact that you guys spoke that, you know, you wanted to get involved in the community. Now that I, what I've seen that, you know, we don't have enough Latinos either, you know, in the CEO sector, in the business sector, because there's so many of us. How do we kind of change that aspect? Because when we see, like you said, in, in you know, the restaurant, they're busboys or things like that. So how do we kind of change that aspect to have more power in the Latino community in terms of just like job position? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting. So in 2021, I became the first Latina on the Columbus City Council. And um, <laughs> thank you. And y'all should give yourselves a round of applause for that. Um, and it's interesting because this is the power of representation. So uh, when we looked at data from the 2021 elections, uh, Latino representation at the voter booth increased by 300%. And that was not just because of me. That was because we actually had three Latinas on the ballot. As I look at um, Christina Vera, who's sitting right here, who's a, a vice chair of the Columbus Board of Education. Ramona Reyes was also on the ballot. Um, and it was the first time, I mean, this was a historic race that we had three Latinas who were actually on the ballot. And I think that that speaks to how far we're, we've come, right? But I think that it's about in, in making it intentional. Like all of us have to think about, I, I often think I'm usually, was usually the only one in the room, right? And when you're the only one in the room, you tend to think about who else is not here with me? Mm -hmm. And how do we create spaces for those people? And how do we create spaces and tables where we are inviting more voices in? You know, in the 50 years my parents have been in this country, they've never not, not just seen someone who was Latino, seen someone from our community who was at the table making decisions for them. Immigrants, migrants, and refugees are the number one factor behind our population growth in Columbus. We will more than double our population. And they're, they're giving projections of 2050. I think that's going to happen a lot sooner. Right? Mm -hmm. And so as we think about that, and we, as we think about the prosperity of Columbus, it has to have representation included, right? Because it changes the conversation. The, the needs of the Latino community are not different than the needs of the greater community. It's just nuanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about um, planning for the people that are furthest away from justice, all boats rise inherently, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're making it easier for everyone and for all people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Roland, what, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, um, I think it, it, we're still struggling with uh, cultural differences in terms of understanding how to integrate and succeed into the community at large. Uh, to me, while there are challenges in general, the biggest challenge is the one we have ourselves. 
uh, is, is understanding that uh, networking, uh, have, owning a chair, taking a chair, because nobody's going to give you anything, is taking it and participating. We're not used to participating in, in, in the community in general. So we need to teach ourselves, teach by example first, you know, I got out of my sofa and, and here I am. Never imagined that I'd be sitting here uh, speaking about these things, uh, but it's important. And uh, so it's really educating ourselves and participating to understand that if we want a seat at the table, we have to earn it. And by earning it, you have to be there present. So those are, I think, are our challenges. Uh, but in general, I think also the, the opportunity is that um, the more we educate the community at large about who we are, what we are, who we are, we come in all colors, shapes, and sizes. And it's so broad. And it's really more about a culture than a race. And, uh, and that's also, in a way, our job. So it's educating the community at large as who we are and, uh, and what our aspirations are. As Luz has said, no different than uh, any other immigrant uh, um, uh, class at any point in time. It's the same story, it's just our turn. That's it. Yeah. And I also want to just elevate, I mean, there are organizations that are doing good work. I look at Proyecto Mariposas, I look at Latina Mentoring Academy, I think of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition, I think about organizations that are doing things to uplift Latinos and to get them in, you know, wells, right? It, organizations that are not just Latino-centric, but thinking about our community and how do we get more people into the boardroom? How do we get more folks to run for office? And so I think it is a concerted effort because we're not a monolith. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, and, and not just a monolith, in like in every sense of the word because I think also it is a very different experience that I've had as a first generation American than my Cuban parents had right and there there are differences that we have and we have to grapple with that and our parents are dealing with some of that now is how mm -hmm. how do we help our kids to fit in and see themselves and how do they honor our our ancestors and where we come from but also push to be maybe a little bit more progressive thinking differently because we are we live here right mm -hmm. and this is our home and our ideas are different do you think a lot of it comes from just uh, the upbringing, the parents, you know, that motivated you to, like, for example, step into the political arena? Uh, would you say that your parents played a big role? Um, if you know anything about Cubans who left before 1970, mm -hmm. every conversation over a domino game or dinner or something had to do with politics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it was my father's intention to like uh, have politically charged conversations, but I think when you come from a place where democracy literally is snatched away from you, I had two uncles who were political prisoners in Cuba. My father was fought against Castro's regime. So for him, it was something very personal. And so I think that, as we talked about um, you know, politics, I think it was just something that we always did. And my parents always took me to vote because they were like, we, we literally came here for this. Mm -hmm. We came here so that you could do this and you have to be an active participant. And so for me, I think it was just part of the DNA of every conversation that we've ever had. Yeah. Roland, what motivated you to, when you said you first came here, you know, that you wanted to be connected to the community? A lot of folks, they just, you know, worry about their nine to five job and, you know, want to go home to their kids. So, but you said you wanted to be connected to the community. So what made you even reach out and said, I want to do more? You know, that's, that's, that's a really great question. Um, uh, there's, I didn't realize the, 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 the fact that most uh, Latino families, politics is, a, is important, a part of the conversation. My dad was actually a congressman in Peru, 56 to 60, mm. right? And uh, so politics, if I wanted to talk to my dad, I had to listen to like an equivalent of NPR at the age of six, <laughs> you know, to just try to engage my dad in some kind of conversation because, you know. So yes, politics has been at the heart of everything we do and, uh, and therefore having an awareness that of a community. And while my professional years is about, what my mother say, me, 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 you know, it's just about me, you know, taking care of my family and building a career and so forth. Once I was at a crossroad where I had taken care of me and my family, I felt that um, it was important, you know, for me to, to share. You know, you get to a point where, okay, I, I have these things, uh, but I also have knowledge. And, uh, and I didn't realize initially that the knowledge that I just took for granted that I assumed everybody had 
you know, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't the case. And once I began to understand that, that's when I realized that, you know, I, I can really bring something to the table here. I can contribute and share my experiences, share my knowledge, and hopefully, you know, contribute uh, to, to the society at large. And that's really what got me motivated to, to get involved. But it, was, it just took a little drop, you know, and, uh, and, and again, my, my thought was, I'll do this for five, six years. You know, it's now 10 years later and I, I don't see the end of the road yet. So <laughs> once you're in, I think you're in for life, but it's, it's so rewarding and, uh, and, I, and I really think, uh, I thought I was stepping in to contribute and actually I think I've gotten a lot more out of it than perhaps I've given. Yeah, and Lulers, we also were, we were just speaking a little bit earlier about um, just the pay gap and you know, Latinos are one of the hardest working you know people that I know the community we're always doing two three different jobs hard working jobs how can we change that in terms of just you know motivate people to say hey what I'm doing with my skills I could own my own business instead of working for somebody well so it's interesting I always say that immigrants migrants and refugees are natural born hustlers we make bake, create consult on something and it's usually your side hustle it's not always your main hustle so mm -hmm. it's really about how do we make it so that the thing that you love to do is the thing that feeds your family and puts gives you security right and I think that we've made great strides I mean I think as I look at Ariana Uyola who's sitting here from um, uh, who just joined the city um, Latinos are, are representing strong in the city of Columbus I have to say, but um, who's, who's really working with small businesses to think about. I mean, it's interesting because I think there's a natural inclination. I think the stat was 2,000 business owners over Ohio. That has to be, that, I, there's like 2,000 in Columbus, right? <laughs> like that, that number has to be off. That's a, that's a, because this is what we do, right? You carve your own path. When, you, when there's a, not a system that you see a path for yourself, you make a path. Mm -hmm. Right? You say, well, I'm going to open the store to sell my food to my people and speak my language because it's the thing I understand. My dad had a store because he had a store in Cuba, right? And my father had the equivalent of an eighth grade education and knew no English when he came to this country, right? But he was a good businessman. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, he ran a lot of tabs, so my mom might question that, but here we go. <laughs> he was a kind businessman. Yes. But I think that that's what we forge forward and do, right? Mm -hmm. I think when we talk about the pay gap, what's important to understand is that for women, you could have a PhD and you will not get paid enough. It does not matter what industry you work in. And, and if you look at, we just celebrated, or not celebrated, but acknowledged Women's Equal Pay Day in March, and that's really, really about white women and what they make on the dollar. Because once you start looking at black, Asian, indigenous, and Latina women, we start getting further in the calendar year. Mm -hmm. So for example, pre-pandemic, Latina Equal Pay Day was in October. Post-pandemic, we are in December. Mm -hmm. That means that I need to work an entire calendar year mm -hmm. to make as much as my white, male, non-Hispanic counterparts. Over the course of my lifetime, I will lose a million dollars in earning power. Me, my daughters, this entire table of strong, beautiful Latina women who are powerhouses in their own right, who come from different backgrounds and have different degrees. And so when we start talking about the pay gap, I mean, we passed at council, and I wanna acknowledge my um, colleague, uh, Council Member Bankston, who's here, with the support of my colleagues, we passed legislation that would remove um, the question of what your previous salary range was from the application process and throughout the application process. So they can't ask you, so you're not starting from a deficit. It is a true negotiation with an employer. Mm -hmm. And this is something that will narrow. It's not going to close because I want to be a realist here. It's going to narrow the pay gap and move us closer to pay equity. Mm -hmm. But I think that when we talk about, especially for Latinos, we have an amazing opportunity right now as I think about the trajectory of Latinos in Columbus. We have to be certain that here in this room, we're talking about a subset of Latinos, right? We're talking mm -hmm. about you know, kind of grass tops Latinos. You know, we're not talking about my mother who worked in a pharmaceutical company packaging medicine literally the entirety of her career. Double knee replacement and had to have carpal tunnel surgery on each wrist as a souvenir for her 40 years of service, right? And so how do we help women like her, you know, who's 83 and still paying for her house? Mm -hmm. You know, because that was her only safety net. And that's mm -hmm. the reality of what we're talking about, is a chasm between these two kinds of Latinos in our community. And so how do we really start to close that gap? 
We have amazing opportunities with our unions where we know that we have skilled workers that are coming from other parts of the, the world that are coming here that could go in and that could get um, certifications debt free. And we're going to need them because as we look at companies like Intel and other companies that are coming in, those are amazing jobs. And you know what we're always gonna need? A plumber, an electrician, we're always going to need someone mm -hmm. who's skilled, because if a zombie movie has taught me anything, those are the people who are going to save us and rebuild <laughs> society. So we're always going to need those jobs. And even if you decide to go to college, you are still going to be able to support your family. It's a road to the middle class for people. And so we need to start having these conversations. The Columbus Promise is another way for our young Latinos to go to college and see a path for themselves for free debt free and we need to get our families to understand what that means because there is dignity in that work there's dignity in that job and it's not the old school like i came here you're going to become a doctor and a lawyer i'm like mommy and papi that is not my path <laughs> but i will make you proud so yeah and uh, roland i think a big thing um what she was saying is just the lack of education you know i was me growing up you know like how she said doctor, lawyer, that's, that's it. Do you think just being part of the media as well is just informing the community, hey, there's grants out there, there are programs. A lot of people don't even know what's in their backyard, basically. That's true. Uh, I think education is, is, is critical. Um, you know, from a business perspective, um, the opportunities that the Latinos have are, are, are tremendous. Everything is really served. But for example, uh, for me, when I speak to many uh, small businessmen, they lack financial literacy. It's so important. You know, you can't project a business, you can't uh, scale a business if you don't understand the basic principles of accounting to begin with, let alone finance, right? So that type of education for business, I think it's very, very important. And, and I think as a culture, we're extremely creative, we're extremely independent. And that is what drives us, you know, to be entrepreneurs. That's what drives us to open that store, to open the cleaning services, to you know, open the landscaping service. Um, and it, it is that, in the, that desire to be independent uh, and to provide for your family. But I also think that it is part of the reason we're all here. Uh, it's that American dream, you know? And it's kind of handing the post from the last immigration group or immigrant group to us. Right? I mean, they're, they're, it is the immigrants that keep the American dream alive. And I think that is what drives us as well. So it's our sense of creativity, independence, and our, the continued search for the American dream. Yeah, and speaking of the American dream, though, with, you know, with inflation and things going up, there was this, some debate that if we loosen the restrictions on immigration, that would help fight inflation. Would you guys agree on that? I'm <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's, here's the thing. I think our, we have a broken immigration system in America, and I think that we can all agree on that, right? I mean, I think that when you start to go down the list, even if you think of Latin American countries, we have probably 50 different policies, right? Depending upon how you come here, depending upon what status you come under, it is a nuanced system, it is hard to navigate. And once you start to have, once you get into like, you need a uh, master's degree to understand immigration, something is inherently just broken, right? And so we need to really start to think about and change the conversation about what that means. Mm -hmm. Especially as I think about our dreamers, when I think about the young people, I mean, you know, again, I think about that story with my sisters, right? Who knew nothing about America, who knew nothing about the, the language, who literally sat in a classroom every day where things were happening around them and they couldn't participate, right? Mm -hmm. That's essentially what we would be doing to these young people who have known no other home than this one, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And for us to say to them, now we're going to send you to a place that you have that doesn't feel like home to you, that you don't understand how it works. I mean, that's a conversation we need to start to have because to me, that is, we're losing our humanity when we start to have that. Before we even get to economics, we start to lose our humanity and that happens real quick when we start talking about and othering people. This happens in our own communities. I mean, as Columbus is changing, nimbyism. I want affordable housing, I don't want it here. I don't know where I want that affordable housing. I don't want renters, which also, by the way, where, where are your kids gonna live? Whose kid is coming out of college and buying a house? Aren't they renters? 
So which renters do you not want in your community? And so I think that that's the conversation that we need to start to have because I think the more that we other each other, the, the further that we get from each other's humanity, mm -hmm. we start to, it, it messes with the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Once we lose our side of humanity, it messes with our economics. It messes with our prosperity. It messes with our legal system. It, it changes everything for us. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I wanna start the conversation from, what are things that we can do in our community? I will say this, as a legislator in the city of Columbus, first and foremost, the top of mind to me is the prosperity of our people and our families, no matter where you come from. If you are here, you will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And that is a policy. I can't change what happens in Washington. I can certainly influence it. I will say this, this whole room together, we can start to make some changes in Washington. Yeah. Right? But as a legislator here, I can certainly start to change policies that affect our families here and keep them safe here mm -hmm. and take care of them once they get here so this can be a place that they call home. Yeah. Roland, you wanna add to that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, to me, immigration is economic growth, economic development. That's, to me, what it is. And, uh, it, it, and I think we're, if anybody is, has open positions right now, whether you're managing or own a business, getting help right now, it's very hard. Um, so you can't grow a business, you can't grow an economy if you don't have immigration, a good immigration policy. Um, you know, I look back at the, I think it was the 80s, Japan was going to, you know, uh, I think outgrow, uh, outpacing the U.S., you know, the trajectory. But guess what happened? They ran out of people. Their immigration policy was horrible. And, um, you know, they, they blew up, basically. And to a degree, that's kind of what we're seeing now. You know, we are all struggling to fill positions and to grow because we don't have enough people. So that, to me, is the most important piece about immigration. Um, it's been politicized, unfortunately, you know, but, uh, but uh, take that piece away of it, away from it. I think once we overcome those, uh, I guess, um, the, the, the political um, games that we're playing with it, I think we, once we get down to business, I think we'll find some policies that will help support the growth uh, of, of our country. So uh, that to me is what immigration is, sound policies that allows people a path to citizenship, those who are already here and contributing, and facilitating those that want to come and can contribute. I mean, there are professionals out there ready, to, you know, doctors, uh, engineers, ready to come in and contribute from day one, you know, and I mean, we just need to create the path for them to come and, and join us. And that also, for me, will contribute to innovation. It's a different thought process that they've grown up with, a different way of approaching their careers or professions, and they can contribute as well. So immigration, for me, is economic growth. It helps innovation as well. And I also think that as we have the immigration conversation, uh, it's not just Latinos coming to America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we, yes, we border. It's interesting, fun fact, um, and I wish I had all of the fun facts, but Google's your friend, too. Um, at one time, there were more Canadians who were here who were undocumented than there were anything else. Mm. And, and somehow, I think when we talk about the face of immigration, we have, like, almost squarely made this a Latino um, issue. And number one, that's also harmful to other communities. Right? That's harmful to everyone else coming from other parts of the world because this is part of their story and their struggle as well. And also it has become, to your point about, it's not even just political, it's like demonizing people who are coming here. And so again, it's a very dangerous slippery slope as we talk about it. We are one segment of the population that has to deal with immigration issues just like there is a whole world of immigrants, migrants, and refugees that are joining us in this struggle here that come from literally every corner of the world. If you've gone to a naturalization ceremony, you will see countries you've probably never even heard mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's important to, to elevate that, that this, is, this really is a community issue, not just a Latino issue. Very well said here. All right, we are gonna to move to questions though from our live stream and in-person audience in just a few minutes. Um, 
Or should we, we do that right now? Should we be moving that now? Oh, one more question. I do want to ask briefly, um, after all that you said, do you still believe that uh, it's possible to achieve the American dream? Absolutely. You know, it, it, to me, it's alive and kicking. You know, the, uh, the, the many, many, you know, when I tell them, yeah, people want to come here, have uh, still family, some cousins, you know, they still want to come here, uh, meet people that, you know, I wish it wasn't so difficult to get in, but, you know, I, I, I think there's so many opportunities there. And, um, and friends tell me, you know, non-Hispanic friends say, man, with all the mess that we have going on here, people still want to come here? Absolutely. Have you seen the messes that are out there in comparison? <laughs> you know, we're in great shape. You know, so so yes, I, I do think, and I also truly believe that the American dream is alive and kicking because of us immigrants. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lulus, short answer, please. I know, I know, I know. This is a, <laughs> this is a hard question here, Jackie. Um, I mean, I think it's what is your definition of the American dream? Mm -hmm. And I think that for too many people, the American dream has been a dream deferred. I mean, even people who, who, who have been in this country for generations, right, centuries. And I think that the idea, I mean, democracy was an experiment, and I think we're still experimenting with it. And what that dream means to you might be different than what it means to me. And I think that, you know, when, when I think about on the very a basic level of again like if you if people are willing to cross an ocean or a desert or get on a plane and like literally have no idea what is on the other side they just know it's better than what they are leaving mm -hmm. i think then we have a responsibility to meet that that expectation of safety and security and prosperity whatever that means for that family all right well it it's CMC's long-standing tradition to take audience questions. So Lainey Cuthbert back there with CMC's curating questions for today's live stream audience. For those of you with us in person, please join Lainey at the microphone. And out of respect for others, please, please keep your questions brief and to the point so we can get as many as possible and we don't, you know, have a little hook to say, okay. Remember, it ends with a question mark. So Lainey, what's the first question? Thank you very much. Freddie Jimenez, and I'm very sorry if I've mispronounced your name, Freddie, um, asks, in regard to the professionals coming to the U.S., what can we do for their credentials to be acknowledged and accepted? This is a major barrier for Latinos coming to the United States. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah. true. It, 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 yes, it, it is. It is a challenge, uh, and uh, and I think the, the, there are programs that are being developed to expedite the process. I, I think I, again, resources are there. People don't. They're, they're, you know, I, I kind of go back to Ellis Island, right? I mean. Immigrants came in on boats, they were processed, they were told what they needed to do, where they needed to go, and they were uh, on, on, on the mainland, you know, ready to take them and point them in the right direction. We're lacking that, you know? Uh, so basically, they're coming, and they don't know where to go, so they reach to the friend, to the cousin, or whatever, and they may or may not get the right information. And you see uh, somebody that is an attorney, an engineer, working as a waiter, right? Because they gotta live. So we, I think, and, and, and I think we in Ohio have that opportunity to, to create this uh, organization that kind of uh, allows a filtering, you know, because not everybody is a doctor, an engineer. Some people just need work, right? whatever it is. So whatever their talents are, whatever their needs are, I, th I think uh, having a, 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 an organization that can route the people and help them expedite, that, I think that is critical. Um, so uh, it, 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 I think we need to figure out how to do this at a state level and probably you know, at uh, uh, a national level as well because opportunities are, are everywhere here. So it's finding them uh, if you are, have not been raised here or understand how the system works, it's very difficult to figure out. And I just want to put a fine point on that. I think it's also about a conversation. We just started a series of immigrant, migrant, refugee town halls um, last night, and part of it was about have, we'll, we'll have several more folks can follow um, along on our social media channels. We'll um, share the rest of the dates, but I think it's about also having conversations with industry leaders about what those, what that looks like, because it's nuanced everywhere, right? Sometimes it's about medical terms, sometimes it's about policies, sometimes it's about certifications, right? So I think it's about, it's a little, 
it's, it's a longer, the reason I answered yes is because it's a complicated question because it depends on the industry. And I think it's really up to us to have those conversations about how do we, again, make this more accessible for everyone. All right, now we have a question from the audience. Yes, hi, my name is Matthew. It's very nice to meet you all. I'm a student here with Otterbein University, and I currently double major in communications and Spanish, so I would be remiss not to bring up the idea of compulsory um, language education for all of the youth here in Columbus. Um, so I am just curious about what are your thoughts on requiring Spanish language immersion for all of our students in our public schools so we can better help integrate our community on a communication basis? One thing, um, Christina, you should uh, give a little Miss America wave because we have one of our school board members here. Well, you should definitely <laughs> follow up with this conversation. But I mean, I think that any time that we're adding skills to young people and giving them the opportunity, I mean, we have a couple different language immersion schools within CCS's um, uh, network. And I think that, I mean, we can see, we even have an international school. We have a school for, for students who are coming from all over the world that they have the opportunity to all be together in a school. So I think whenever we give our young people you know, one more skill, one more tool in their tool belt, it is helpful, especially as we think about Spanish, because it's the second most spoken language in this country. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a skill you're gonna use, right? And so I think uh, how we change it to policy is a different kind of conversation, especially, I'm not sure if you've paid attention to um, some things that have been coming out of our state legislature and their ideas about what people should and shouldn't be learning. So it becomes a little bit of a slippery slope, but that's where local municipalities coming in with a partnership with our district leaders really could help to see something like that really become policy. I, I, I think being bilingual, trilingual is really important because it's not just about learning a language, you learn culture. And that's the biggest benefit, I think. The more broader we are in our thinking, I think the more we can bring to the table you know, once we graduate from school and, and, and become part of the workforce. Um, so having that ability to uh, have a different perspective on any one issue, I think it's, it's, it's a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. All right, Lainey, are we going to take another audience question? Okay. So I have a question, um, Kay Wilson. Um, we have United Way here. I think Columbus Foundation is here, Columbus City Council. How can we bring together, coalesce a group um, on a unified effort? I know I struggle when I try to find the numbers for new immigrants uh, for the Latino community. and. I only have the source of the census. So how could we come together in a unified effort, maybe on a grant uh, or policy, grant to support policy, to find out the actual numbers for Franklin County and the businesses and um, those that are of the Latino community, the community of color in general, just to find out our businesses and the economic strength that we have here in Franklin County? Uh, you know, this, this is a great opportunity. Uh, we ourselves struggle with this, right? And we rely, you know, on the resources, uh, government resources, to get some of that information, but we also know that it's not accurate. Um, the answer is yes, we'd love to partner uh, uh, with these organizations so we can better understand. It's also for, and we do this for the sake uh, of our own business. You know, we need to understand where the community is so we can reach out to them and uh, make sure that they participate in, in whatever, you know, the, the, the matters are at hand, um, you know, from voter registration to, to health matters, right, uh, and education. So, so we would love to partner. I, you know, afterwards, uh, I'd love to sit down and, and speak with you and, and, you know, set up a meeting so, so we can talk about it further. Uh, these are one of the the, the aspects of uh, as to why I got involved because uh, with media with a privately held company we can actually expedite a lot of uh, of these matters and uh, I, I would love to be able to have further discussion on that. And Kay, um, our office has been working on a. Um, we bring together a group called the Latino Leaders Group. It's uh, modeled after um, an, another group um, where essentially we're working to how do we 
really build our organizing muscle as a Latino community. We've been acting as a convener for that group. Um, we started doing calls, we did our in-person, how do we kind of organize? When I look at the Ohio Latino Affairs Commission, which Lily Cavanaugh, who's the executive director is here, who is an, an amazing data source and a center pole for everything Latino within the state of Ohio, who can then start to break down some of those numbers for us locally. But this is the same conversation that we've been having. We've had different um, kind of organizing effort. I think that we are at an incredible tipping point as a community. The most organized I feel like we've been, the most connected that I feel like we've been, the most resourced that I feel, feel like we've been. And I think that now's the time where doing some of the efforts that you're talking about. And our office has leaned into that. We put together an IRMA Council, which is Immigrant Migrant Refugee Council, which will really act as it. And there's people from all over the Immigrant Migrant Refugee Diaspora from all different nations that are really helping us to be kind of a sounding board for this work and thinking about what do we need to do. And that's that's a service not just for my office, but for city council, for the mayor's office, for the community as a whole. And so we're looking at what are the ways that we can really use um, you know, the influence that we have in this position to be a convener for the community with everything coming from the community, but knowing that we have a space where we can bring people together. Thank you. Buenos tardes. Um, my name is uh, Niamo, uh, also Wendell Tober at the Columbus Police. Um, I don't usually tell people that you know, I'm with the Columbus Police Department, but I say I defaulted you people because you're kind of special here. So uh, first of all, um, thank you all of you for serving. Um, I get thanked a lot for what I do, right? So at the end of the day, thank you for taking the time out to serve your communities and giving of your own time. You're not always getting paid for what you do and you're not necessarily doing it for the pay, right? Uh, with that being said, thank you for what you do. A few things I wrote down as you were speaking and so forth. I wrote down integration, cultural differences, um, participation in the communities, educating the community, and also Latino organizations. So with that being said, uh, I'm a community liaison officer. I'm on the ninth precinct on the east side of Columbus. Anybody knows of anything about that? Basically between East Lamar, Broad and James Road area, uh, Council Mental, Brosso de Bedia, I believe uh, that's your area. Um, so with that, I have um, been on the apartment about 20, a little bit over 25 years, born and raised in that side of the area, on that side of town. Since I've become a community liaison a little bit over a year, um, the word I keep hearing here is community, okay? So I'm a community liaison officer, right? I'm not a uh, black liaison officer. I'm not a white liaison officer. I'm not, I'm a community liaison officer. With that being said, the Latino uh, community is part of that. So with that being said, I had an uh, event last year. Uh, it's in the Fairmore area. Uh, there is a, um, I know because I worked there quite a bit, there's a, quite a bit of Latino uh, population in the area, and I wanted to reach out to them last year. Some people gave me some promises that didn't come through, but anyway, uh, with that being said, we're going back out there to this area where we were able to donate two brand new basketball hoops in ground uh, to where they didn't have any. We want to uh, donate uh, brand new picnic tables and in-ground grills where they used to be. A friend of mine would like to install two uh, soccer goalies professionally installed. All right, what, what's the question? At the end of the day, the question is, how do we make that connection? Okay, one, two, I get that deer in the headlight look as far as a police officer is concerned, and I hate that for the individuals that give me that. I don't know if it's from back home or the, what they've experienced here. How do we break that barrier? How do we bring it down? How do we get that connection? How do we get them to come out and join and serve and be interested in certain communities that they live in as well? Yeah, yeah so, I, <laughs> I, so I will start. Um, so, you know, you can always reach out to my aide, so we should talk. That's actually, as you know, my elementary school where I went to Fairmore is my elementary school and around the corner from my house. I think that the conflict, I mean, it is a, I, I think 
today in America as we talk about our conversation with police force. I mean, I think it is a, it is a complicated conversation. And when people think about safety, they pull on personal experience. And that is at the top of mind for people. And you bring your entire self and your entire life experience into anything that you encounter. And I think it's, it becomes even scarier when there's language barriers. It becomes even scarier when there's cultural barriers that you don't quite understand and you don't understand situations when they're happening and emotions are high. And so that's probably a lot of, we've, we've done some work with CPD around talking um, with immigrant migrant refugee communities. How do you work with them? Understanding some, the cultural impact, understanding what they might be bringing, the information that they have from where they came from, the information and the experiences that they've had here. And so I think it's an ongoing conversation. And again, one where I think people need to come with open hearts and open minds to listen, to understand and how we work through the problem, not around the problem. So, and I appreciate you um, elevating that. And again, I think having that continued conversation, thank you for your service to the East Side. You're also a fellow uh, Eastmore warrior, so I appreciate that. But let's continue to talk. I agree, let's, uh, let's talk. Um, that's what we do. We, we connect the community to services, to organizations, um, you know, come on board and uh, I think we're in 12 to one, I think we have a space where you know community leaders come and, and tell us about what they do and or tell the community, our listeners, what they do. We have a newspaper, they can do the same. So let's work together. That's what we're here to do, we're here to connect. Uh, go ahead, All right. Lainey. All right, from online, uh, Cesar Dominguez uh, asks, how do we encourage Latinos to build trust in the U.S. banking system and start investing? I guess this actually applies to all of us. <laughs> How can we change the negative narration, uh, excuse me, narrative of banks and Wall Street? Those are very, very deep questions, Frank. I'm glad, I'm glad you're going first. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I was going first. I was commenting. I mean, I, I think, first of all, I mean, I think, again, when we start talking about Black and brown people are underbanked, period, right? And there's a myriad of reasons. There could be identification issues, there could be trust issues, there could be access issues. And I think that the same way that we take the approach, a learning approach, into working with organizations that are culturally competent so that we can begin to have the conversation to break down barriers for people. I mean, I think with everything, you know, it's interesting. We were having this conversation last night at the town hall. Um, Working with our community means that it's nuanced, right? It means you're gonna to have to put in 10, 15 more percent effort, but what you're gonna get back is exponential. And so I think that that that's, makes people nervous about how they do that. But there's lots of experts in this room, right? Because there are organizations in this room that can partner with a bank, that can partner with other organizations that are doing this work so that we can educate our community, so we can talk to them in ways that they understand, right? You can't talk to a, a, um, uh, an, I would say any immigrant, migrant, or refugee about saving money without first having a conversation about the people you need to take care of. Because somewhere in this world, whether they are across an ocean or across the block, you're taking care of someone. You are responsible for someone. So in my mind, I can't get over saving for me first. How am I gonna do that if my mom's not gonna eat? And so I think, it, again, it's a nuanced conversation. It just changes our approach. So if I knew the, uh, what uh, is going to happen with the banking system. I'd be in an island somewhere, you know, and jetting back and forth. Um, that's just a very broad question, but, uh, but bringing it down to, to Ohio and the uh, Latino community, uh, and only because it's uh, bank related, um, we are, uh, have been working now for two years uh, with uh, Esperanza, which is the only um, credit union in, um, in Toledo, based in Toledo. And finally, after a gazillion hurdles, uh, they've been authorized to establish a branch here in Columbus, uh, which for them is a huge market. So, um, yeah, that, that is huge. And, uh, and, and, and the hope is we're gonna pilot Columbus and then look to Cincinnati and Cleveland and so forth. But I think uh, going back to what Lourdes is saying, 
you know, uh, speaking not the, the language, understanding the needs. Uh, and more importantly, what I really like about it is the fact that they're not just looking at the credit score. It's a community reference, right? Do you know Huang? Oh yes, Juan has been here for 10 years. He's been mowing lawns. You know, he needs a $10,000 loan because he needs to buy two more trucks, and that's the stuff and that we need. Barriers so that you can have that. So even you know, it's not going to ask the same thing a traditional bank would ask for, which is what makes it so unique. Correct. All right. Well, we are got the wrap. So thank you so much, Ludris and Roland. I'm going to toss things over to Matt Barnes. Well, thank you all so much. Have a great conversation. Hope you all enjoyed it out there. Lord, I want to give you a chance. Do you want to plug the event tonight at 530? I do. Thank you. Um, so this evening, we are having a free and open to the public uh, workshop at Columbus State Community College. Starts at 530. It's a brief panel on pay equity and pay, um, closing the pay gap. And then from there, it's a free salary negotiation workshop. So geared towards women, if you, but, but we'll welcome everyone. Everyone should learn this skill. Um, but please come tonight if you are available. Um, we still have some registration, room for registration, so. Well, again, I hope you all found today's forum enlightening, um, interesting, and, and frankly, just eye-opening in some of the issues that are still out there, but also a lot of the work that's been done. Uh, I know I'm born and raised in Columbus, and from when I've been born to now, I can't imagine a life without Latinos in this community. I mean, let's be honest, you make the world better. You just do, all right? <laughs> um, we need your ideas, we need your opinion, we need your perspective, so I know whether it's Jackie, myself, or anyone in the media too, help us help you. If there's stories that need to be told, you feel like we're not doing our jobs well enough, let us know uh, so we can make sure we tell the masses about the great work that you all are doing and what more needs to be done as well. I uh, want to thank today's partner again, the Columbus Council on World Affairs. Uh, today's sponsor, the United Way of Central Ohio and Bell Harbor Management of Ohio. I knew that was coming. Uh, thank you once again to the Grange Assurance Audubon Center, our virtual seat patrons, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation and the Columbus Dispatch for today's live stream. And once again, big thank you to our speakers, Councilman Lourdes Barroso de Padilla, Roland Madrano, and our host, Jackie Orozco. Give them a round of applause. And listen, if this is your first forum, don't make this your last one, right? We have a lot of great ones there in the forum flyer, including next week, uh, next forum, a one-on-one -on -one with former Ohio Governor Dick Celeste will be here uh, at the Audubon Center. So take a moment, also answer that short survey on the forum flyer. And again, make, an, make a, a note to come to a future forum as well. Have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.